I'm Brian V at Why We Work. Today, I had the great pleasure of speaking with Mr. Jamie J. He is the owner of Bottleneck Virtual Assistants. He helps companies not bottleneck themselves, doing the daily tasks that other companies will do for them. He's been through a lot, and he does a lot. Not only that, the way that he presents himself is of joy, out of gratitude, knowing what he has gone through. But what impressed me most was after the camera was off, he poured into me, offering to me anything that he could do for me, which I just thought was wonderful. I was speechless. I didn't even know what to ask. But what you see on the camera is what came after as well. So sit back and have a listen to Mr. Jamie J at Bottleneck Virtual Assistance and listen about his ripple effect. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work, and I have the wonderful pleasure of speaking today with Jamie J. Good day, fine sir. Hello, nice to meet you, Brian V. Nice to thank you so much for having me on. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm excited to chat with you. I'm excited too because I had because of what just happened a moment ago. We were trying to get connected. I had the opportunity again to watch you in your own podcast. And you have this energy about you. It's it's very um, <laughs> contagious and it, it's really exciting. I know we don't always have it, but you, you seem like a very pleasant guy to speak with. And I know the work, some of the work of which you're doing that I hope to get into um, in the introduction. I, I added that. But now, can you, can you bring us back into, because this is why we work. So it all starts from somewhere. What was your first job, Jamie? Your very first, first job. First job. Uh, I hired my little brother and with no money down. <laughs> and we lived on a golf course. Uh, we went and jumped in the lake, got a whole bunch of golf balls. Uh, we sold golf balls with a hack in the side of them for 25 cents. And ones with no hacks, we sold for 50 cents to a dollar. And then we found that we were on the exact opposite end of the clubhouse. So people were thirsty and we decided to implement a secondary uh, stream of income. So we added fresh made lemonade. So we had lemonade uh, that they could purchase while they looked at the balls and, and our sales actually increased. So my brother and I uh, we brought him in and uh, we did a 75-25 split first and then we ended up doing 50-50 because uh, my brother loved getting in and hunting with the balls a little bit more. So he needed a raise. <laughs> how, how old were you? Uh, I think I was 12 and my brother was 10. What, what made you like... I mean, thinking now, when I was 20 or 30, I, I see a lot of my balls go into there. I'm like, hey, there's a good business. But at 12, what would, what would make you want to do that, right? Like, what, what, would, what was your desire, motivation just to, to make some money? Well, um, I think it was fun. It gave us something to do. It was during the summer. Um, we had just relocated to Colorado from Alaska. And um, we were just we kind of didn't know what we were doing. And uh, one day uh, a golfer came by when we were sitting right by the fence and I said, did you see a ball come over here? And we we're like, no. And I went to go help him look and I found like three or four and he goes, here you go. Here's a dollar. And I said, Whoa, you gave me a dollar for finding four golf balls. Huh, cool. How do I find more? <laughs> what and did then, you uh, parents think of you doing that just i mean with the oh, lemonade stand is, my, my mom was right there helping us make the lemonade and she'd bring fresh batch of lemonade out and and uh yeah she absolutely loved it she thought it was uh she thought we were great do you think like i speak to my kids and i have some students that i speak to about this of encouraging kids to to start something like that to be innovative i mean the lemonade stand is one of the oldest things for kids to do or anyone to do, but for kids to do, would you encourage kids to think of ways to learn the value of work at a young age, or would you allow them for their own motivation reasons to do something like that? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, and, and if you think about it, if, if we, in our ripe old young age, whatever we consider <laughs> our age to be. Um, we know the lemonade stand has been around a while, but if you put yourself in, in the shoes of a six-year-old, a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, this is 
brand new. They are cutting edge. They are starting a business yeah. in a lemonade stand. And, and, and for that reason, whether I see someone outside a group of kids, usually it's two or three kids, the friends get together and, oh, we want to get the latest, you know, video games. So let's, you know, let's go earn some money or hopefully their parents will push them in that direction. Mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of entrepreneurial spirit. And, yes. and that starts from a young age. So every time I pass a lemonade stand, I, I, I wouldn't say every time. Mm -hmm. quite a bit or if they're on a road my wife and I may walk down and we'll pay for it because I like I like rewarding kids that that try to do something creative uh, whatever that may be I think it's fantastic we're a sucker for the Girl Scout cookies you know and uh, you know so we want to make sure that we make them feel good in hopes that hey they they feel like they've done something successful and we'll continue to do that and I think it's just a really positive way uh, to help kids out these days because what I, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is giving your kids everything. Uh, you're setting them up for failure. Uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, uh, you're setting them up for failure because uh, if, if one doesn't understand the value of a dollar, yeah. uh, I don't care if you're six or 16 or 26, um, it's going to be a struggle. It's, it's, be a struggle. it's very valuable. That's great advice to when you see these kids selling product you know, to the best of your ability at that time, you might be in a hurry, but throw them the dollar, throw them whatever it is, $5, whatever it may be. It Maybe encourages them. It encourages them to, to keep on going. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and kids get real creative sometimes and they'll do small, medium and large. You know, I will always take the large or I always take the upsell if they offer uh, I, you know, I love asking, what else do you have? Or do you have anything else? Uh, do you have anything that goes with this? Well, no, we don't. And sometimes uh, something will snap. And it's the craziest things kids come up with. But it's like, that's a great idea. Yes, I'll have that too. And it just makes them feel really, really good. And uh, I just think it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's neat seeing the smile come on their face. And then they take that money that they worked really hard with, uh, either creatively speaking with the signs that they drew or all that. And then they get to go out and they get to purchase something on their own. I remember when I did it, I bought a little model airplane that I was looking at and I felt like, wow, this is the best toy ever because I earned this. It was fantastic. It's, it's a great way. I mean, it, I can't get out of my head this weekend. We had some friends over and they had children, they have children and they were playing with our children and we weren't really paying attention to them because they were playing and we were talking. And then they said, okay, mom, dad, come to our cozy cafe. So we have a tent in the living room, just like a little sort of fun tent. And they built this cozy cafe. They put the sign up, the open, they put the menu on it and they gave us coupons to come to buy. And they had a little tea set and they were so happy of doing it. And I was just, I was quite, cause they know what I'm doing and, and promoting work. And I'm like, Yes, that's what I want my <laughs> kids to do. But I think we should encourage them more, right? And we don't always do it yep. the right way, but hoping that they will get something and then start their own thing at a very young age. Yeah, it's all about rewarding them. I remember my brother and I making up tickets and giving them to our parents and they came and watched our little play. You know, <laughs> it was the goofiest, probably dorkiest thing in the world that didn't make any sense to them. But, you know, it was neat. Uh, we, you know, we had them get the tickets they sat down uh they had their popcorn they were ready to go and we just had a lot of fun um that was one of the benefits of growing up in the 70s uh you know was, um there's it was just it was just really neat and i i think a lot of us get sidetracked with all the distractions uh in the 21st century i.e uh screens <laughs> um and and it, and it alleviates a lot of that family time and i really believe that um close-knit families uh, really help in preparing someone for the world because uh, my, my wife's daughter, my, my stepdaughter, uh, this is her first year in college. She's out of the house. Um, wow, are her eyes going to be open now? It's a completely different world from, you know, coming home, opening up the cabinet or uh, the cupboards and, you know, there's there's some potato chips they can ground, <laughs> grab or there's a, there's a drink they can grab and they don't have to pay for it. Now all of a sudden it's a different world. Nobody's going to give them that anymore. It's good. Like the lessons that we've learned along the way, like in hard ways, of like when you go off on your first day, you know, to a college or a university and 
<laughs> you open your cupboards. Oh, these cupboards are very big and bare. Mm. What? This Up is Roman quite, it is. This, this is quite different <laughs> than when you were not jumping in the drink or stirring one with lemonade. What what type of jobs did you find yourself getting into as you got older and in your teenage years? Uh, yeah, well, um, it, life got really tough. Uh, we were homeless uh, twice while I was a kid, once while I was an adult, as an adult, homeless meaning living in a 1979 brown suburban, Chevrolet suburban. And uh, I, I got a job at 16 at uh, McDonald's. And I remember still to this day, clear as a bell, my mom and my brother coming through the drive-thru ordering my 20 piece chicken McNugget. And I think one time I got 31 pieces in there. Um, now I stole and, and I know that that's wrong. I definitely understand that. Um, at the time, I didn't quite realize what that mm -hmm. meant. I never got in trouble. I never got caught for anything like that. But I, I knew that that was wrong. And looking back on it, uh, it, it, my family having a little bit extra to eat um, trumped that. And I try to justify theft mm -hmm. in that way, but I have a hard time with it. Um, but I still did because I know that's all it is. And you know, if you work at McDonald's, especially back in 1986, uh, you weren't making that much money. <laughs> and uh, so we would save up enough to where we could get a hotel um, about one or two days a week. And then off you know, your living off of, off, living. off of the, off of my living. And then uh, my dad finally got a job, um, an actual really good job. And uh, we moved to Huntington beach, California and lived right by the beach and had a great time. But, that was a really big lesson for me, understanding the importance of work. And even though I couldn't afford a house or anything like that, it made me feel good. The value of contribution and working hard. And many people may not, I mean, I respect the living daylight. So I'll go through a McDonald's or, well, I don't really go to McDonald's anymore, but if I were to, to go to a McDonald's, um, I'm so nice to the person. I don't care who it is that I uh, drive through or there. I respect the living daylights out of them because uh, uh, I've been there. I understand, you know, how challenging it is. And for them to take the time to work in a job, uh, work hard, uh, support their family, maybe their single mother, single father, who knows what their story is. But I think if you can just give them a couple seconds of, of a smile or thank you so much for helping me out anything you can do to brighten their day because they could be going out and doing something else selling drugs or doing something crazy um getting in trouble and and to value what they do for a living and why they work they have some motivation for it i just love being able to be there and saying hey thank you for doing what you're doing it's it's, I don't care. I don't care if you're working at McDonald's. I don't care if you're a, a, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. It doesn't matter to me as long as, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, you're a good person and, hey, it's worth a smile. Um, yeah, break it up. And 40 years ago or more, a McDonald's opened in my hometown. And then when I was a little older, I went to McDonald's and I still go to McDonald's. I, I have a, a weakness for it. <laughs> and I happened to go visit my mom. I'm in South Korea now. And I went to go visit my mom. Um, she was in the hospital in February. And I went through the same McDonald's. And I went through the, the first part, which is the cash part. And the lady that was there was the same lady that worked there when I went when I was a little kid. And I remember oh, wow. my mom would give me like 10, 20 bucks. And like, okay, you know, a single mom would give me 20 bucks. And, and, uh, go get some McDonald's. So I'll get some for her and some for me. And I said to the lady, I'm like, don't, please, please. Are you not the same lady? Cause I know it was, but I was just trying to get around of, you know, the timeline. I mean, yeah, you were here when I was a kid. She goes, yeah, I probably was. And I go, how long ago? <laughs> she goes, well, how long do you think ago it was? And I said, you know, I'll calculate and I want to be conservative. And I'm like, maybe 30 years. She goes, no, dear. I was here when it opened. And there's a few other of us here, a couple managers, and we were here when it first opened. So almost 40 years ago. And wow. I, said, I said, how do you do it? And she goes, we love our job. Yeah. And I said, well, I even said, 
thank you for your service. Like it's almost <laughs> like, like, like they were dedicated and I, and you know, McDonald's is, would be tough and you know, it's, they're yeah. not salads. They're not eating salads there. So it does take a toll on you. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I appreciate everyone's work who, who does something that is, is for the benefit of other people one way or another serving, Amen. Um, helping with yeah. food. So after you help, I mean, that's an amazing story in and of itself of you at 16 working to support your family. Um, and then you guys had a break and went out to California. And did that bring you into high school? Yeah, that brought me into high school. Um, I actually lost a year of high school because of us being homeless. I wasn't able to attend school my in between my freshman and sophomore year. So I had to redo my sophomore year because I didn't have enough credits. And when we moved to the new location in Huntington, I, you know, I didn't know anybody and my mom tried to get me on the football team. They wouldn't take me because my eligibility being one year removed. Mm. Uh, so I joined, joined the surf team because uh, it wasn't, you know, the traditional sport. And that was a lot of fun. So I got to paddle around the pier for PE class in the morning and then go to school. That was neat. I met a couple of good friends that way. Um, and then, yeah, from, from there, it was, it was a while before I worked again. Um, it, I, I went and I got into racing and stuff like that. And that was kind of my work. And my, my dad was doing really well at the time. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, then all of a sudden I found myself in a position. My dad went to jail uh, for embezzlement uh, and we lost everything again. And so at the age of, I think, 18 and a half, uh, and my brother, 16 and a half, two years younger than me, um, we found ourselves homeless again. And we're like, what the heck? Uh, we were going to a race in Oklahoma City, Ponca City, as a matter of fact, Oklahoma. And I uh, got a call from my dad said we had to turn around and come back all the way back to California. So we did. And we came back and he kind of told us what happened. And we were like, what the heck? So within three days, uh, we got back to California moved out of our house and we didn't, we didn't have anywhere to go again. So uh, tried to sell everything we could, our motorcycles and whatever we could fit into the trailer and the truck and the car. And uh, finally, my mom finally got a, a, someone to rent her a small home and that's where we stayed. Uh, and I stayed for about another six months uh, because I got a job as a lineman, which is really hard work. And I uh, didn't really like it because I had to drive about two hours back and forth to work each way. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt bad because I didn't want to be there and not contribute to my mom because she was working. She got a job with the how is How is your mom doing at this point? I know my dear wife, we've moved from country to country a few times and been in between jobs. Stressed and my out. wife is... So rest. <laughs> yeah. But she wouldn't have it any other way. She loved us. You know, she did everything for us. So I went and joined the army. Cause I felt guilty yeah. um, being at the house. And so I, I, I came and told her one day, I said, Hey ma, I just, I just signed up for the army and she broke down and she did not like that at one bit. Uh, but you That's know, it's funny though, you know, she, you're going through so much and that is, you know, a secure job, right? Joining the military and that can give mm -hmm. you stability and your mom probably knows that and recognizes that, but not my baby. No, yeah, no, no, uh -uh. no, she wasn't. Especially when me. she heard I was signed up with the infantry. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll be well protected, mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a challenge. Yep. And thank you uh, for your service. How long did you stay in the military? Uh, three years to the day. Yep. Yeah, three years to the day. 90, 90 to 93 no, 91, January of 91 to January of 94. In all those ways, because I know it, it's going to lead into what you're doing now, but all of those ways shows that you're learning to appreciate service. Yeah. And the, and the people who, like the military, whether McDonald's, even appreciating the struggles of coming from nothing, going, you know, from something to nothing to something to nothing again, and understanding and not, and not being prideful and arrogant saying, you know, I deserve this position or I have all that I ever need. And I don't need to remember the people that are on, on the bottom that seemed to develop very early with you. And it, I think probably led you into what you're doing now. 
Yeah, I, I would I would say um, that that would be a good assumption, except for the fact that I deal not, did, still did not understand the value of a dollar. Believe it or not, mm. uh, f- from from when when I was into the racing and all that, we were really spoiled. Uh, we didn't pay for anything. All we did was race and have fun, and our food was always there. We were never told we needed to get a job, and that was a big deal. Well, I went into the army. I didn't manage my money very well. Uh, mm-hmm. I got out of the army, went back home. The day I got out, my wife told me she wanted a divorce, and I had plans to move in with their family and get a job, and all, everything was lined up um, with her dad's company. I don't remember exactly what it was, yeah. but then uh, there I was. Um, no place to go, uh, no vehicle, nothing. Called one of my friends and uh, stayed in the back of his dually truck. He was kind enough to let me do that for a couple of days, and I felt so guilty because he's going around to his job. He worked construction, and I'm like, I just can't do this. And um, they weren't hiring, so I couldn't get a job there. And I said, you know what, Eric? Thanks you so much. My buddy's name is Eric. Uh, amazing friend of mine since ninth grade, Eric, Eric Lawrence, wherever you are. Uh, we talk every now and then, but uh, uh, you, you were, he was a big impact in my life. So I had my army rucksack. I said, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go. And uh, he tried to stop me, uh, invited me to stay with him. And I said, absolutely not. My pride was too big. So I walked around for a while. Then I realized, well, crap, I don't have any money. Uh, so there I am out of all places, a McDonald's, begging people to buy me a hamburger so I could eat. Uh, Wow. You want to talk about something that's hard to do. Uh, You got to really check your pride and do that. Unbeknownst to me, my good buddy, Eric had put $60 in my rucksack and he didn't tell me because he knew I wouldn't have accepted it. So here I am begging people like for two days to get a little bite to eat. And I remember finally getting a a cheeseburger or something like that and taking a bite and just kind of savoring it because I was so hungry. And then I'd wrap it back up and put it in my ruck and walk a little bit longer and taking another bite. <laughs> like, like, wow, I really got to take this slow because I do not want to bag again. So I ended up making my way down to Huntington Beach uh, where I had some friends from when I lived there before the army and they, they were kind enough to take me in. I got a couch. I got a job at, at uh, Bennigan's and uh, found my way out of the predicament I was in and got myself an apartment. And uh, thanks, to, thanks to those guys there for uh, letting me crash on the couch for three months. And they finally said, Jamie, you got to go. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, uh, I got my own place. And uh, yeah, that was, about, uh, that was about the time when I, I made enough, got my apartment, and then I entered into corporate America there. So you said you didn't really value the dollar. When did that start to gain some traction for you? You don't know, this is crazy. Uh, I worked in corporate America, made some decent money, um, and actually made really good money, but I always never seemed to be able to save any of it. Mm-hmm. And it just kept going and going and going. And took me, I was in corporate America for about 12 years, it took me 11 years to get out, go out on my own, and here I, got, here I was on my own starting in 2006, started my own agency, and uh, made, made decent money. And then 2008 hit, I lost everything and I didn't save. I was going out, I was having fun. I was doing all that stuff. Um, and we lost virtually all of our clients in the span of about three months. Cause we were a real estate based ad agency when the, <laughs> when the, when the, the real estate there. market just crashed, literally crashed. And I was living in Stockton, California at the time. And if you, I don't know how many people remember how hard it hit, but Stockton was the number three city in the entire nation to get foreclosures. One in three homes had a, went into foreclosure. So needless to say, um, reality hit me. And I vowed from that moment on in 2006, the next venture I get into, I had to work a couple jobs and, and that stuff to get back on track. But I, the next venture I do, I'm going to make it as recession proof as possible because I learned in a down economy, the number one thing that companies stop doing is marketing and advertising. Those budgets are gone. And the second thing is staffing. They they start laying people off. So I wanted to come up uh, with a way that I could thrive in a down economy. Um, And lo and behold, here I am. Uh, I run a 
a virtual staffing agency um, that survives. Um, can you explain that? That's bottleneck, virtual mm-hmm. assistance. So can you yeah. explain what it is that you do for clients? Yeah, sure. So a, a lot of entrepreneurs, team leaders, business owners, business leaders, um, C-level executives are extremely busy throughout the day. Extremely busy. Some of them are missing work are missing family time. You know, uh, maybe they have to call and say, hey, I can't go out on date night. I got to work late. Uh, this weekend, I got to work. I'm sorry. We got to post that off. They're missing the kids' soccer games or, you know, the sporting events or, you know, going to the recitals, whatever that may be. And uh, um, what we've found is the reason the reason they're doing this is they're so entrenched in the the mundane details of their work that they can't really focus on the high level activity that would make them more successful. I don't know how many people are listening or, or you, Brian, how many times you've gotten back home or if you work at home uh, and you're, you're done working for that. Oh, I forgot to send that email. I got to run to go do that. Mm-hmm. Just that little act of sending an email is probably going to take someone 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And it may be a, a two minute email, but you have to switch your mindset. You have to leave what you were doing. You have to, tell your better half or whomever it is that you're around, or maybe you're alone and, and you don't need to do that, but you got to say it to yourself. Hey, excuse me. I got, I forgot to do something. I'm going to go do this. And maybe we stop another activity. Then you sit down, you got to fire up the computer. You got to do all the stuff. You got to remember what it was, read through what it was. Then you got to send it and then you got to make sure you did it. Then you got to update your notes or whatever it is. And for a two minute email, you spend a half hour of your time. I don't know about you, but when I check emails, it used to take me an hour a day. Easy. I'd be doing it an hour a day and 80, 90% of my emails, I'd just throw in the trash, but I'd, I'd scam over them, scan over mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. but I'd throw them in the trash. Well, my assistant now, I spend about five to 10 minutes a day on email because my assistant goes through all of that for yes. me. Same thing with uh, managing my calendar. I used to manage my own calendar. I don't do that anymore. I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday now and Friday morning. So at 11 o'clock, my wife and I go play hockey. That's how we met. <laughs> After we're done with hockey, we're off until Tuesday. And, and that's because we systemize the business so well. And you asked what bottleneck virtual assistance is. That's what we do. We, we, we um, source high, highly skilled personal assistance for very extremely busy executives so they can outsource the mundane details or their day-to-day operations so that they can focus on doing high level activity. And I think if you're a business owner, you should be working in your business about four to eight hours a week. The rest of the time you need to be focused on growing, on innovating, on thinking, on planning, on all kinds of other stuff to grow and scale the business. Um, different ideas, different concepts, partnerships, things like that. You don't need to be working in the details. That's why a personal assistant is so unbelievably helpful. And believe us, um, we wouldn't have been written up in Forbes twice had it not been for this. Our first year of doing business in this particular business, I only did $11,000 and it was just me. Well, here we are now close to 50 on our team and uh, four years later, we exceeded the seven figure mark, which is unbelievable. And that's because of the power of leveraging your time, focusing on the high level activities, talking to Brian V, uh, and, and all the while, all the details of the, of that are extremely important systemization, processes, workflows are being handled in the back end by people who like doing that. How did you come up with the name? And do you remember when you came up with this idea to do this? I mean, this yeah. is based on your whole, I mean, Jamie J, you, you were bottlenecked for most of your life. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I right. am the bottleneck. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, I mean, listening to your story, you weren't down once, you weren't down twice, you weren't down three, you were down. Yeah. And you were into, you know, one way to put it is to be bottlenecked and you weren't able mm-hmm. to, to soar to where you are now. And I'm yeah. not all about like everyone's going to be rich or famous and all of that, but you went through, through some very tough time. I don't even think you were bottlenecked. You were squashed under the bottle. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And how did you come up with this idea based on your experience? And, and the, the name is, is wonderful. Yeah, thank you. So I was part of a mastermind. Uh, I had an agency, that a web-based creative agency, and 
uh, all of my friends and all my colleagues were asking, how are you getting these virtual assistants to help you with this mm-hmm. stuff? This is fantastic. And I said, oh, you know, I go to the Philippines and I have a good relationship there. And because uh, one of my former business partners was one of the P- Philippines in California. And that's, that was my first experience back in 2006. Um, and, and they wanted to know how they could get one. I said, oh, mm-hmm. just here, I'll introduce you to this person. And they said, Jamie, you need to create a business out of this. And I said, really? And they said, oh, yeah. So uh, one of my friends that was kind of doing this part time out of Las Vegas, uh, someone I used to work with in corporate America, uh, introduced me to uh, a fella. And uh, I just took it from there and ran and and absolutely loved it. And with regards to the name, I wish I could claim uh, credit for it, but I absolutely cannot. A good friend of mine, Mark Hafner, um, uh, is a uh, Emmy Award winning audio producer, amazing fellow, very, very creative. He and I were talking about what we were doing and a lot of executives, they're their own bottlenecks. They're, they're afraid of giving away the secrets. They're afraid of having someone else do the work for them because it won't be up to their level of standards. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they, they think, well, they don't know anything because it's in my head. I have a certain way of doing things. And that's a major, major bottleneck. Every single owner that is challenged in their business is without system processes or workflow. And in my opinion, are the bottlenecks. And I'm not afraid to say that to their face because I think they need to understand that. Now, I don't call everybody a bottleneck, but you have to, you have to really look at yourself in the mirror and figure out if you're running a company and, it is, and you are not in a position that you want to be in, um, you're to blame. The There's no one else. That's like the, I've seen recently the show, The Prophet. Yeah. Like that's many of the problems that he comes across when he goes to these businesses, they are exactly. the bottleneck, <laughs> right? They're looking at these yeah. people and they're like, Hey, my business is great. No, you're the problem. Yeah. You're not outsourcing. You, you want to have all control and you are inhibiting your, your business to, to yeah. strive and to be what it is. Another show that comes to mind is that bar rescue show. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Yeah. I've seen a couple of same episodes. Thing. Yeah. And, and you notice that, what they do is they work on the person, not the business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then that yeah. helps the process much easier. What oh, is gosh. difficult? What is most difficult about your job? I mean, everything is not, you know, you're not completely unbottlenecked. There's still some difficulties that go with the, the business that you run. What is a big difficulty that you have? Yeah. A lot of people say 80, 20 rule. I, I, I call it a 70, 30 rule. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to do. I have to, um, do processes and systems and I have to do review stuff and I have to go into our base camp and, and our, our project management software to see where the team is at and what we're doing. That's 30% of the stuff that I could, I could do without, but mm-hmm. it's stuff that I have to do in order to be on top of things. Now on the other 70%, that's where I go on podcasts. It gives me a ton of energy. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I love traveling to events, although at this current time, as the time of this recording, we're in COVID, so you're not seeing that as much. I like doing virtual events. I love live streaming. I love, I love just having fun, interacting. I love taking breaks, reading some books, getting some good ideas, innovating on my time, which is during the week working time. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I thrive. That's what I love. I love partnerships. I love like right now I'm partnering with the university in Canada and we're doing a really in-depth detailed um, uh, analysis of remote work, distributed workforce and how, what three things are going to be most difficult about this. And it's, it's just really neat doing all of that stuff. That's 70% of the job I love 30%, not so much but I understand that's what I have to do in order to accomplish the goals that I set for myself. And we've set collectively together, both my family and my team, my business team. Jamie, you've had an interesting life and you're still living it. How can you say that work has brought you through life? I mean, you, you mentioned some McDonald's and, and uh, some other, even from jumping into the pond and selling lemonade but how has this work helped you through your life and how has it been like the constant in your life to help you move on and to continue? I I love this question. This is a fantastic question and thank you for answering it, asking it so that uh, I, I think what work has done for me is the necessary means to an end. So there's a lot of things that I care about in my life that I want to be able to help 
educate others, um, plastic pollution, uh, mm. things like this that I love to do that I can't afford to do because I have to work to get there. But oh my gosh, um, imagine how awesome it would be to be able to work hard enough to earn some kind of monthly recurring revenue or sell a business or do something where you have that freedom of time to do, to make a bigger impact. We here at Bottleneck call that the ripple effect, to make a positive impact first and foremost in your own community, then in your region, then in your nation, and then you have a global impact. And I have that global impact now with our staff in the Philippines. Uh, it, I cannot tell you how much it makes me just want to jump up and down when I hear uh, one of our VAs bought their first home. One of our VAs, 30 some years old, I won't say his, his age to protect him, uh, has six kids, bought his first car. And that was because we created something for that now another family can thrive on, not to mention all the uh, business owners that can now leverage their time. They have a lower cost. They're able to put more money back into their local community. Um, we are in the process of uh, sponsoring an at-risk youth. We would have never been able to do that. But the work, the way you ask this question, the work is getting me to where we want to get to. We want to get on a sailboat and we want to sail around and we want to talk to different communities. And our hope is that we can record what these different communities are doing with regards to all this plastic pollution, see what they're doing, see what they're doing right, see what they're doing for cleanup, see how the plastic pollution is impacting their local environment. And we want to record this and work with different junior high level kids, middle school level kids. We think elementary is too young. Mm -hmm. We think high school, they're too set in their ways. Those middle school years, man, if we could get that put into the course curriculum for them and have the kids follow us around for a term, get that put into the curriculum, and maybe we turn some of those kids into oceanographers. Maybe, maybe they want to have a passion for doing something that's going to make the world a better place than what we found it in. Um, and that's just, I know we can't change the world that way, but if we can change and influence one person to be more responsible for what it is that they're doing, it's only going to make it that much better for the for future generations to come. So that's why we're so driven because it's an ends to a mean for something even bigger, more impactful that we call the ripple effect. That is good. I like the ripple effect. And that's how work brings you through. It, it encourages you to make more ripples. Exactly. Right. Exactly. 100%. Could you give some advice? And even you mentioned the valuing of do the dollar or a dollar, how you didn't before. So just advice to people who are not working, maybe they're first looking into their first job in between jobs, maybe because of things that are going on now, or they're not happy with their job. So advice, but also based on that valuing of a dollar, how, yeah. how it would be how you've come to value the dollar and your new perspective, your appreciation of the dollar and the value and there in the reason why it is important to work. Yeah. I, I would say my advice would be to write down one of the biggest dreams you have right now and write it down. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I say to, to do that is now you have a goal that you can get to. But don't rely solely on that goal. When you write down your goal, that's kind of something, that's like a dream. Maybe that's something that you want. But I will tell you this right now, when you achieve that goal, you're going to want to know what's next. Mm. So for me, I have a goal like that. But I know every day I set an objective that I wish to accomplish. And the mission in our company is exactly that. A mission for a company is a mission in life. It's a daily objective you hope to achieve each and every single day. Write that goal down. Did you tick it off your list? Great. At the end of every day, I always kind of look at my day and I said, this is what I did. 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 And it feels so good. Like I've accomplished something. And I think that's a major, major driving factor to go where we want to go. One day, my wife and I will be on a boat. We will be on a boat sailing around. I promise you <laughs> that we will be there um, unless something tragic happens, mm -hmm, God forbid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we will be there. And when that happens, guess what? We're going to be able to experience something else that we're going to want to get to from there. 
And I will tell you probably one of the best feelings in the world, and you could probably talk to a million speakers, teachers, anybody like that, when they get to share their experience with others and you see their eyes light up and their ears perk forward and they're just consuming what it is that you're sharing with them because you're sharing with them through the best of intention. This is persuasion, not manipulation. Mm -hmm. I want to make it that very clear delineation. Yeah. Persuasion is actually good. Mm -hmm. Manipulation is bad. But when you're talking to people and you see them light up like, oh my gosh, that is so neat. I want to do something like that. Or I want you're going to feel so good and you're going to be driven to continue doing that because you're going to be offering a lot of positivity in the world. And I think ultimately that's what it's all about. Jamie, I, I talked to someone the other day and he mentioned about appreciation and looking at your life and what you're doing now, how much, how valuable do you find or suggest to look back once in a while, to look back at our lives and say, Hmm, I have much to be appreciated for have much to I, appreciate if you can see <laughs> you should be very appreciative if you can walk you should be very appreciative um if if you can't walk but you can see you should be appreciative if you can hear you should be appreciative in my opinion it's i have such a blessed life and here i am a, in an 1100 square foot home i mow my own lawn uh you know we we do everything we do a lot uh, we're very responsible for how we live now but Oh, I came from a, a lunch luncheon today. We practice social distancing, by the way. We wore our masks. Mm -hmm. But the gentleman that was uh, speaking uh, was talking about uh, he, he's, he had an organization that helps at-risk youth. And he had one story. Get this. Um, sex trafficking is a big thing. And I, I know I might be going off in a bit of a different mm -hmm. world, but, no, okay. but this goes into setting perspective with the question that you've asked. 11 years old. I'd been bought and sold over 15 times, a 15, 11 year old girl addicted to methamphetamines, addicted to alcohol, um, hadn't been to school since first grade, was on the street, rescued, um, and rescued, by the way, in high heeled stilettos, short skirt, unbelievable. Think about that for a second. 11 tragic. years yeah. old. Absolutely tragic. Then you think about the 11 year old that's going to school and comes home and is complained because um, you took the iPad away. It's all about perspective, right? Fast forward five years, this 11 year old girl is now in the honor roll, starting her first year of high school. She's been helped out by that organization. And it was a woof. Yeah, what a story. Like, emotional. And uh, I don't think there was a dry in the room. Uh, at least I didn't have dry. And uh, it, you look at something like that and holy cow, I can go back to being homeless and I'd be better off than that poor little girl was when she was 11 years old. So you have to, what you do and what you're normally used to is ordinary, but to so many other people, it's mm -hmm. extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. Where can people find you, Jamie J? Oh, you can just Google uh, Bottleneck. Um, you can visit bottleneck.online. Uh, and uh, I think probably you can even do Jamie J now. I know a singer, Jamie J singer was, was beating me on Google. I think I've surpassed her now, hopefully. But uh, yeah, go to bottleneck.online. And if you want to talk or reach out, I'm on all the social media channels. And uh, we do a live stream every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. Central. It's called Live with Bottleneck. And uh, I talk to a lot of people um, that uh, have stopped the bottleneck in their business and share ways of doing the same for others. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Jamie J, two more questions. One, how do you rest? How do you find rest? What do you do in your rest? Oh, well, this is going to sound weird. One way that I find rest is playing hockey, <laughs> believe it or not, because my mind rests. I focus only on hockey. It's, a, it's an unbelievable break. Uh, I absolutely love it because I don't think about work. I don't think about challenges, anything. I think about hockey and it's a lot of fun. So for that two hours when I'm playing hockey, I just absolutely love it and my brain rests. The other way is uh, my wife and I, uh, we boat. Uh, every weekend we go down to the lake 
uh, just about every weekend, unless the boats broke, you know, boat bust mm-hmm. out another thousand. Those things break down a lot. But we, uh, we really enjoy going out to the lake, hanging out in the boat, just going for a, you know, a 45 minute boat ride and maybe stop off at a cove and jump in the water. Um, those are great ways to relax. Uh, and, you know, we get some good rest too. We sleep and stuff like that. But those, those are probably the two best ways that we kind of, you know, unwind a bit. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's wonderful to promote work, but we do have to rest. And I, you probably see this with some of the people that you, you work with, your clients that are overworked. And that's why you're doing your business is because they're... 100%. I, can, can I say one more thing, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, several, several months ago, I got a call on a Saturday morning from a client of mine. This is a pretty big dude. He's all tatted up. Just big. I would not want to meet this guy and have him pissed off at me in a dark alley. Absolutely not. Very, very strong presence. I got a call Saturday. And normally, I don't answer my phone. So this mm-hmm. one, I answer my phone. Um, uh, and he goes, Jamie, hey, I, I, I'm calling. I know it's a Saturday morning. I just wanted to call and, and let you know excuse me, let you know that this is the first Saturday I'm spending with my wife and my kid uh, since we've in the, since in my business and I've had my business for three years that I have not been working. And I just want to let you know, thanks to you for allowing us to hire an assistant She's taking care of all my, all my stuff for me. And then the phone rustles away and you hear the wife say, Jamie, thanks. uh, (laughs) Thanks for getting my husband back. Yeah. That was powerful. Right. Right. That, that's uh, totally unexpected. And now I love sharing that story because it, wow, had we never created a bottleneck, we would have never made a difference. In that because there's a truth life. with, you know, if we're not doing it for our family or some other good reason, as you mentioned, for children or uh, what are we doing it for? You know, you know, we're not just trying to climb some ladder and get the money. There has to be another reason. And if we're not spending time with that reason, then it's all for naught. Yeah, money's money's good. I'm, I will not say, I, I mean, money is good, but what's even better um, is it's, it's not, not what you say or what you get from something. It's how you make someone feel. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's all the difference. Jamie J, last question. Why do you work? Why do I work? I work, uh, I work so that I can take care of myself first and, and so that I'm healthy, financially stable, so I can help uh, with the global ripple effect of so many others. Yep, that's exactly why we do it. I like the ripple effect with Jamie J, bottleneck, virtual assistance. Thank you, sir. You are a gentleman and I appreciate your story and your work. Thanks for having me, Brian. This is great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.